Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have a very special guest with us in the studio today. Jeff Downs is here. It's great to see Hi, you. Nice to see you. Thanks for inviting Thank, me along. Thanks for taking time to, uh, to come over here. You're out with uh, Asia. Yeah, we're out with Asia and um, we're on the same bill as Journey. Mm -hmm. And we're their special guests, if you like. Sure. And it's been going really well. It's been a, it's a nice pairing of two bands that were around in that sort of period of you know, the early 80s. So um, it's been a lot of fun. Right, right. You mentioned that you have a few more shows on this leg of the tour, and then you're back out for a couple of months, and then you're out with Yes. That's right, yeah. We've, we've got, um, I think this was only about 13 or 14 shows, and then um, I've got a couple of months off, and then a much more intense tour with maybe 30 shows, but again with Journey in Asia. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're out with Yes of All, um, which is a kind of touring version of Yes with, with other bands and stuff. So it's. Um, it's going to be a, a busy, busy year for me, I think. Yeah, no doubt, no yeah. doubt. So that's uh, that's two uh, intense bodies of work that you're dealing with there with Asia and uh, and yes. How do you keep the two separate? How do you balance all that? Well, I've got a fairly versatile keyboard rig, so I can um, I, I can sort of modify it for each of the two bands accordingly. Um, because you know, yes, is I'm playing a lot of stuff that I didn't um, play on originally, so. It's a slightly different learning learning curve to the sure. stuff that I did myself. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it, it works pretty well. I, I don't think there's um, you know it, the only the only possible problem is the actual juxtaposition of the tours. You know because it means that I might go straight from one tour to the next, and uh, and that that can be a bit tiring sometimes. You know, but yeah, um, right, right. Is there a <coughs> rehearsal period in between there, or did you just hit the ground running? We just go for it. I think there's generally we have, you know, a, a rehearsal period before each tour um, because latterly we've been incorporating, particularly with Yes, we've been doing these um, uh, complete albums in their entirety. So that takes quite a lot of putting together, not just um, musically, but also the video presentation and everything like that. Right, right. As a uh, as a outside observer, if you will, it's interesting to me that uh, there's sort of this nucleus of prog bands, if you will, that came out of the UK with Yes, Asia, uh, ELP, Genesis, uh, and, and uh, uh, interesting that that so many of the same musicians have worked together in supergroups, and there's sort of this this orbit that, that so many musicians yeah, have sort of stepped it, into. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, with all those bands you mentioned, and obviously, you know, we've had. We've lost a few people over the last few years, particularly um, more recently John Wetton, right. um, who was you know the founder and the voice of Asia. Uh, that's been very tough. Um, uh, and last year was Greg Lake and, and Keith Emerson. So um, you know all those bands, all those people were really very very close. You know because it it was that whole movement in the UK. Mm -hmm. It all happened around the same time. And uh, and you know of course Greg was in King Crimson and ELP. Carl was in ELP in Asia, uh, you know, I've been in Yes and Asia, Steve Howe's been in both as well. So there's a sort of group of, um, uh, of people that, that is actually not that big, you know, it's, not, it's, it's a very sort of small family in a way. Right. And, um, and I think that's why there's been a lot of interaction between the various members of, uh, of all of these bands. You know, for instance, uh, John Wetton did quite a lot of stuff with Steve Hackett from Genesis. So there's been a lot of this sort of cross-pollination of projects over the years, and uh, uh, and some fantastic music come out of it, mm -hmm. I mean, no doubt about it. All right, absolutely. It's interesting that even as these different uh, uh, supergroups, for lack of a better way to call it, yeah. have have sort of uh, evolved and appeared, they they still maintain a, a separate identity within them. Yeah, they do, and I think you can tell who who the bands are. You know, if you hear a, a sni snippet of Emerson, Lake and Palmer, you know, you, you know exactly who it is. You know? Right. Uh, so they all did have their their own unique and ident uh, identity, and um, you know I think that when you look at what a great history of work that is, and you know I mean Yes is coming up to 50 years in existence next year, so you know a lot of these bands are coming up to that kind of p period where they've been, you know, they were formed in the late 60s. So um, you know, I'm very fortunate that I've I've been able to play with Yes for you know on a, on a couple of occasions and. Uh, couple of periods and, and it's been a very um, you know I, I sort of came in I suppose a bit later in the day because I came from the pop field with the buggles video kill the radio star all that right, stuff right um, uh, and I so I was a 
I was a fairly late, late arrival on the scene, but um, from a, a keyboard standpoint, to be playing with those kind of bands, you know, the keyboards have got um, a very important role in, the, in a lot, all of those bands, you know, whether Genesis, King Crimson, um, even Pink Floyd, you know, all those kind of British bands that came through, uh, the keyboard was a very important part of the sound. And, um, you know, for me to get into a band like Yes was, was a sort of dream of every keyboard player because, right. you know, you, you, you're you in the best possible place you could be as a keyboard player mm -hmm. in terms of rock music. So, um, right. so it was a great, great um, thing for me, that. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous. So stepping back, both your parents were keyboard players. My mother was a piano teacher. My, my father was a church organist. So we had the keyboards in the family. But, um, right. Uh, I used to hear my dad practicing, and then I started to study uh, classical organ as well. And um, you know, I used to be the, the pump boy. You know, sometimes I'm pumping the bellows for the organ, and uh, uh, that, that was that was really it. And I grew up on, on a lot of English church music, mm -hmm. and and I think that when I started writing with John Wett in particular, he had a very similar background, and so when we started composing the Asia songs. We had this very sort of almost anthemic choruses that we we used to like to write, you know, and, sure. and that was very, became very much a part of the Asia sound, as much as the, you know, the great instrumentalists in there as well. Um, mm -hmm. That was our that was our thing. We had we liked to have those big choruses coming out. Right, right, yeah, yeah very recognizable melodies and, yeah. and uh, standout sections there. So, um, who was she's French? Ah, she's French. Well, um, it was my very first college band. I, I went to music college and. Um, I was living in a, a kind of a communal house with a load of other guys, and we reformed a band. And um, uh, and this guy had a he's the bass player who ended up working for the BBC um, as a sound engineer, eventually. But he had a he had a French girlfriend, uh, and someone was talking to him. Said, you know, who's that? Who's that girl over there? He said, oh, don't worry about her. She's French. <laughs> so that, that's, that that's was the name of the band. <laughs> yeah, so well, that's a good name. Yeah, we'll stick with that. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. right, right. So after that band, you uh, relocated to London and pretty early on connected with Trevor Horn. Yeah, I, I, I was lucky in so much as I got doing, as soon as I moved to London, I, I got involved with jingles, doing, you know, 28 and a half second jingles um, for this, this company. And, uh, and it kind of, you know, it was, it was difficult to make a living then because I, I, all I had was, you know, a couple of keyboards. I had um, a, a cut down Hammond and a, and a and a clavinet and a string machine and um, a Fender Rose, that was it. Right. That's what I was working with. Um, and latterly a mini mode, but um, so I was kind of the, the, the orchestra that used to come in and, and I got quite a lot of session work, which, which kept me, you know, kept me uh, off the streets as it were. Mm -hmm. But it was only when I answered an ad in Melody Maker, which was the sort of musician's Bible at the time, had all the ads for various people. And it said something like chart acts looking for a keyboard player. Um, so I applied for it and I got a mini mug by that time and I turned up with a mini mug and a string machine and Trevor Horn was putting the band together because he was dating the girl singer called Tina Charles at the time who just had a number one single in the UK. Um, and he... Uh, he looked at the, the in, in, instrument, the minimum, and said, you're the only guy who's turned up with one of these, you've got the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the job, not really on my abilities, but on the strength of having a, a, a synthesizer, which he was very impressed with. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we used to do some covers with her and some of her stuff, but uh, we, we kind of hit it off in a, in, a, in a way that he was much more producer-minded and I was more musician-minded. So we, we had a kind of interesting combination and then we started to work on a lot of demos for people in the studio and that was how we crafted the Boggle sound was because I had these instruments and we used to get whatever we could out of them you know we'd use any kind of audio gimmick we could mm -hmm. to soup up these demos for people and um, in the end we said well why are we doing it for all these other people why don't we do it ourselves and so that's how the Buggles was formed. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. And where did the song "Video Kills the Radio Star" "Video Killed the Radio Star" come from? Well, we had that song probably in about probably forty years ago now, 1978. Mm -hmm. And 
Uh, it was written with another guy called Bruce Woolley. Uh, there were three of us. And Trevor was mainly responsible for the lyrics. And Bruce and myself did the music. And um, uh, it was... It was inspired by, by a, this is what Trevor tells me, anyway, it was inspired by a J.G. Ballard book, who was a science fiction writer, British mm -hmm. science fiction writer. And um, he had a, a, a short story called The Sound Sweep, which is about this kid that used to go around studios sweeping sound up in the studios and, and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a real kind of far out concept. But I think it, it got this idea that you know, the history of sound was something that was was being lots sort of melting away, you know, and uh, and and in a way, the, the the inspiration of the song was also about how the um, when when the talkies came out and took over from the silent movies, a lot of the actors kind of disappeared because the, the, their voices weren't suitable for the talking movies. So right. so these guys kind of vanished and. And we had this idea about this is what happening with radio. You know, the guy, the voice on the radio, when you see the visual picture of the guy, uh, is not the same, you know what I mean? And so he's not going to make a, a good tra transposition from being uh, in, in a, you know, from a, a radio presenter to the reality of being on a video screen. So there are all these little kind of nuances and uh, things at play that, 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 that help to formulate the title of the song. Right, right. It was. Uh, I, I remember when the very early days of MTV, that video played constantly. Well, it was the first one ever played. Yeah. Right, and it, yeah, it, it yeah. played all the time. And, and there, tell us a little bit about the impact that that had. Um, well, it's, it's funny because when it first happened, um, there, there wasn't really. The, it not really established itself in any great way. So, so guy told us about two months, two three months later. Said, "Oh, you know your video. There's this new." cable channel, it was a cable channel at the time, mm -hmm. started up and um, he said, you know, your, your video, they used it to open the whole thing. I said, oh, that's great, you know. Didn't really think much more about it because there were a lot of cable channels at the time. But then, of course, it started to snowball the whole thing and, and, and probably, you know, six months later when it was literally everywhere and all the kids in America were totally hooked on it, um, that's when, to me, it had much more significance, you know, mm -hmm. sort of after the event, really. Right, right. So uh, you and Trevor Horn then made the move over to Yes, which was interesting, again, as an outsider, seeing the, the Buggles and the, yeah. the video there to move to, uh, the album was Drama, correct? The, the album that you moved over for? Yeah, it, it horrified a lot of the old Yes fans. You know, <laughs> these two guys, you know, these these two interlopers from the pop music scene, right. suddenly coming into their revered band, you know, it was like, what the hell's going on here? But. Um, I think when people heard the album, they they had a slightly different opinion about it because um, the album was was pretty heavy. You know, it was quite it was a rocky album. It had a lot of um, the, the different attitude from previous Yes albums, which had been Tormato was the previous one, um, and it was a. I think it, it shook shook a lot of people up and thought, well, you know, uh, Yes are probably trying something different. You know, they're they're not just resting on their laurels doing the same stuff that they did in the 70s, it, it really, I think it, it pushed them into a new generation of music. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think in many ways we helped to sustain, as many people who've been through Yes over the years, have helped to sustain the name by introducing new elements and, um, you know, uh, the, the lyrics, for instance, were much more technological. There were Yes, you know, things happening down the fairies in the bottom of the garden stuff, you know, that right. Yes were kind of known for and these ethereal, you know, it was almost godlike lyrics. Uh, we come up with something like Machine Sai, you know, which is a hard driving track, um, talking about smokestacks and pylons and all, all this kind of. You know, it was it was very much more of a, a techni technological uh, uh, references. So um, that was something that I think did help um, turn Yes into a different band. You know, particularly in the eighties when. Of course, Trevor produced the big album for them, 90125, mm -hmm. which was the next album after Drama. And um, uh, they, they became you know, a different band, but still had that same identifiable sound. Right, right. So stepping into a, a band like that that had a, a legacy of, of great music before and then the music that you created, how much pressure was there on you to, to duplicate those original tracks in concert? 
Um, probably not as much pressure as there is nowadays because yeah. because then you know you weren't um, you know you weren't auditioned by YouTube you know whereas um, uh, you know you did a show and you got on with it and you got on with the next show. Um, th nowadays, it's that people are much more critical. People sit at home and they watch you know every single performance, every single nuance on their uh, on on their uh, computers, but um, it, it's. It's a very, very um, awe-inspiring band to, to come become a part of because the, the music is very technical. You know, yes, it's a, a sort of band that they never did anything twice the same. So each section is is different. It's either in a different key or a different tempo. You know, nothing that is a straight repeat. Mm -hmm. And so it does require it did require quite a lot of learning. And and I was particularly tuned into trying to be as faithful as possible to the original parts um, and you know at that time you, you you didn't have access to the multi-tracks now you've got to sort of jam it you can hear exactly the entire keyboard part you know from fragile or something like that um, so yeah i mean it, it it was it's it was a tough it's a tough band to be in but um it's very rewarding once you get it right 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 so uh, following that, the uh, supergroup Asia, which you've been, I would say, the most consistent member. There was just a very brief period in the band's history when you weren't in the band. Other than that, you've, you've spanned kind of That's all right, the yeah, different yeah. different iterations. Tell us a little bit about that journey through that band. Um, it's been uh, an incredible journey. I think that um, when when we first formed, I think a lot of people thought it was, it was a kind of... Um, formulaic thing that had been put together by record company executives which was not necessarily the case i mean we worked very very hard on that first album and i think we rehearsed for six months before we actually went in the studio mm. so um it was not a case of oh yeah we'll just put these guys together and see what happens uh and so we've we fashioned this sound i think because of where steve and and, and carl and john had come from they were looking for Again, you know, to a, 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 a different kind of style. To, although it was going to be the same musicians, and uh, they wanted a much more concise presentation of the music. And John was very, very song oriented. So um, th th we kind of developed this style. I suppose me coming from the more pop background, I could have took a little bit of that into that uh, area as well. Mm -hmm. um, and. We 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 got a pretty good sound. I think a pretty unique sound. Um, you know, when we cut that first album, uh, we we didn't really know what to expect. I mean, everyone thought, well, yeah, you know, it's it's going to be good. We're on a new record label on Geffen Records. Uh, everyone thought, well, it's going to be it's going to do okay at least. But of course, when it came out, and then it just went bang. You know, and all of a sudden, um, the sort of fairly modest tour that we book we booked. You know, the, we had the demand to go into the arenas as the as the album went higher and higher up the charts, ended up at number one for nine weeks. Um, I suppose with that kind of a success, you know, there's only one way to go at, <laughs> from that point with, from your debut album, which was, uh, it was huge and sold mm -hmm. millions of copies and, you know, it was all going very well. But uh, I think the, the record label wanted us back in the studio almost immediately and that was something that we weren't really that well prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, I think still we did a reasonable job with the second album. But by that point, I think that, you know, there had been cracks starting to appear um, on personal levels as much as musical levels. And um, it was, uh, you know, we start, I think we lost a lot of momentum then. And then John left and, and Greg Lake came in briefly uh, we did this big show presentation on MTV from live from Japan, and uh, I think which was one of the first satellite broadcasts uh, that, that that went across. I think it was five satellites altogether, you know, just, just like that around them. Um, so it, it was um, it, it, we, we lost momentum then. And I think that um, you know when we got around to doing the next album, Steve had left then, so. We were kind of, we, as I said, we had lost momentum. We, we were in more in, in not, not in bits, but uh, we'd lost the, the record company confidence because they didn't think that we were um, uh, selling out as best we, sh we could do. 
Um, so yeah, it, and, it, and that's why it stopped in about 1986. We um, we pulled the pulled the plug on it, and and I concentrated more on record production for that period. John moved to LA and did um, uh, started writing there with people. So we became very sort of disjointed, I think, um, because we just went our own separate ways. Carl went back with the LP, um, uh, and Steve went back with Yes. So it. It, it sort of everyone almost went back to the place they've been before, right. and um, uh, and it was just it was just a memory at that time. But then when I um, when uh, I was talking to Carl and Steve at one point, and uh, it was around about the beginning of the nineties, and and I said, you know what, I'd like to go out and and, and do some Asia stuff, you know, and they said, okay, well, so they kind of came along for the first bit of it. We carried on with a with a guy called John Payne singing. Um, uh, and didn't really do that much over over maybe ten years or something like that. Um, uh, just the odd album here and there, maybe three or four albums. Mm -hmm. And then the the big moment came back probably about um, eleven, ten or eleven years ago when we decided to contact everyone and reform the original band. And and it was. It was just like it was back back in the old days, you know. It's not like you could turn the clock back, I don't know, twenty odd years. It was um, it, it was quite amazing, and uh, certainly from that point, we all got on really well. We 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 felt, I think, that at that point, that the, because we we'd been up there so quick and, and down so quick, uh, it was almost like we had a lot of unfinished business to attend to, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's really how we viewed it. And so we got in. We did some really great tours, some big tours. Um, we went all over the world. Um, we did recorded some new albums, and uh, and you know it was uh, uh, to this day it's been it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Uh, but obviously, you know the big the big sad sadness for us was was when John passed away earlier this year. That uh, you know. Um, he wanted us to carry on, so that's why we're, we're keeping it going. And, right. and this tour has is, is very much been a, a, a kind of a tribute to him and his music. Right, right, right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So you, you mentioned uh, record production, uh, that you had, had gotten more into producing. You have a unique perspective, having been on both sides of the glass, both as the artist yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the producer. How do you think that affects the way that you produce other artists? I, I must say that I... I I didn't really like producing in the end because I think it took the musician out of me, you know, hmm. um, in a way. Because I, I mean, I did a, the very first big production I did was very successful. It was actually Steve Hackett from Genesis and uh, called a band called GTR. Right. Um, uh, you know, and that did very well, particularly in America. But I, I found that I ended up being more of a referee than a hmm. um, than an actual musician. So. Uh, um, and I was having an, an engineer with me, so I was more of a more of a musician producer as such. But um, it, it's, uh, it, it didn't actually sit that well with me because I I'd always before been kind of involved. My own production had been involved in in uh, you know my own music, if you like. So it was just a kind of extension of the musician. But when you actually have that division, and you say, "Now you're the record producer, and that's the musician," uh, it's it's quite a tough role because um, you 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 have to wear a different hat. Right, you know? right. Well, you, you mentioned the the GTR album, which was, was a, I was a big fan of that album. Oh yeah, uh, thank I think I thought it was a very interesting concept of pairing Steve Howe and Steve Hackett and kind of giving yeah. them each half an album, if you will, to uh, yeah. to kind of to kind well, of. The uh, difficulty uh, was keeping them apart. Yeah. No. Well, that, no. that was that was my question. Is yeah. is a uh, you kind of jumped into the deep end there because yeah. you're not starting with an unknown band. You know, you've you've got musicians yeah. who have who've kind of been there. Uh, you know, kind of a difficult position to step into, I would think. Yeah, that was difficult because I think the. Um, the, the rhythm section were not a, were not a particularly experienced recording outfit, so that was difficult because I'd always worked with people before that had you know the full uh, studio sensibility, you know. But these, uh, particularly the drummer, didn't really he'd, he'd never made an album before, so mm -hmm. that was kind of difficult in one way because no, this is the way you got to do it, you know. This is the way we do it. Um, so that was a bit of a, a, a little bit of a friction. Um, but having said that. Um, 
the difficult part, I think, with Steve and Steve Hackett was the, both so much creative guitarists that trying to fit one around the other and, and who plays what solo, that's, that was the hard part because, you know, they were both so very talented guitarists that it's like, you say, well, should he play there or shouldn't, you know right. what I mean? So that, that was the, the kind of choice that was, uh, uh, that, that I had to make. And that, that was, that was tough in a way, but you know, I, I, I'm still, I'm still very friendly with both of them. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, I don't think anything bad went down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, sometimes that, that friction and that, that back and forth can result in an even stronger sure, yeah, uh, musical sure. result, which I, I think in that case it, it certainly yeah, did. So yeah. that was a, yeah, a wonderful album. Uh, you, you, we've talked about Asia, but in parallel with that, you've also done a lot of projects through the, through the years as well. Yeah. You're very prolific as a writer. Can you talk to us a little bit about your, uh, your songwriting and these different projects you've worked on? Well, I've worked with, um, I mean, in the last few years, I've been working with a, a, a songwriter called Chris Braid, who uh, is much more pop orientated than me. He's come from, you know, he wrote for the X Factor people and, uh, uh, you know, um, America's Got Talent people, all those, you know, he's very much uh, a mainstream pop writer. Mm -hmm. um, and he moved over here about five or six years ago and he's been very successful. He's worked with Beyonce and um, Christina Aguilera, and all, you know, a lot of, lot of um, high profile people. So, um, but his his love is like sort of there was the Buggles, you know. His his favorite band of all time was the Buggles. Nice. So he contacted me and said, you know, we'd like to do some writing, and and uh, and so we 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 kind of put together a, a Buggles Mark II called the Dow's Braid Association, mm -hmm. and we're on our third album now. And uh, you know, a lot of people really like it because there's a little bit of nostalgia in there. There's a bit of those old keyboard sounds that that uh, that I used to use on the Buggles and the old Selena string machine, you know, which sure, um, yeah. which was one of the substa substances of, of a lot of the arrangements that I did, as we put it through so many devices with echoes and digital delays, well not digital delays, the analog delays at the time. Um, so yeah, uh, so that's an interesting project that that um, is, is sort of ongoing, and then. Um, uh, obviously, I've, I've wrote a lot of stuff with John, um, which you know is is a uh, you know I'm very sad that we're not going to be able to do that again. But right. um, uh, but we had our own project called Icon, mm -hmm. which again was was another outlet for our writing. It was a bit different from some of the songs were were, were in, in the Asian mold, but um, but we had a much more we we tried to pick the songs that we wouldn't be able to do with Asia. You know, very often they were uh, we get girl singers in and guest artists and the cellist and so it was a little different, um, a, a different vibe, you know, to uh, to the Asia stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was very dear to both of us. I think that, uh, that we we had that p parallel project running alongside Asia. Right. So um, uh, and you know, just going on again. I mean, I've still been working with Trevor Horn, so. We, we still do stuff together as the Buggles. Mm -hmm. um, we do the odd gigs. We've been doing a bit of writing this last year. So it's almost as like it's, you know, so since I got back with Yes and Asia and the Buggles, it's almost like everything's just gone full circle, you know, <laughs> right. and back where I started. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but in all three bands at the same time. So it's kind of, it's not nice, you know, and I think that uh, uh, I think it's nice that, that I still, got on with a lot of the people that I was there with back in the early days, you know, going back 40 odd years ago, mm -hmm. that I can still get up on the stage and play with those people or, you know, we can go out for a meal or something like that. It's, it's, it's really an honor to be able to do that. Right, right, that's wonderful. So I, I always ask my final question <laughs> when I have a, a, a master musician like yourself uh, in the studio here. You've worked with so many great musicians over the years. We've talked about a lot of them in this interview. What is it that makes a great musician? Um, I think it's got a lot to do with originality, and mm. I think that <coughs> I think that if um, if I, I was one thing that I would advise any anyone who was going to become a musician or or was a musician and was trying to apply their way uh, around, I'd say that you know you you have to try and get that stick to you an original concept because that's what's going to separate you from people just, you know, doing what, doing other things, you know. Right, right. So follow your, uh, follow your muse. Follow you, follow it. <laughs>
right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Jeff, thanks so yeah, much. Thanks very Such much. Such a pleasure Thanks to have you here. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, good luck with the, uh, all of the simultaneous things that you have Thank going you. on. It's, a, it's uh, an honor to have you in our studio. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. And thank you for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute. I'm Mitch Gallagher.